Okay, we'll, uh, we'll start. Hello everyone, on behalf of the Councilors of Real Estate, it is a distinct privilege to welcome you once again to the session of What's Next for Real Estate and Life Experience. The logistic industry, and the torpedoes, full integration ahead. Thanks for joining us. I'm Michelle Couillard, CRE 2021 Global Chair of the Councilors of Real Estate and President CEO of Buzak Properties and Equities in Montreal, Canada. The Councilors of Real Estate is a distinguished international group of accomplished leaders solving complex real estate challenges, experienced, innovative, and credential problem solvers. Counselors practice in 21 countries and offer expertise in more than 60 real estate discipline across all asset types and classes. Each has earned the prestigious CRE designation. This webinar series represents the very essence of the compelling thought leadership for which the Counselors of Real Estate is known. To that end, we'd like to offer you a complimentary subscription to our peer-reviewed professional journal, real estate issues by visiting cre.org slash publications with an S. And to learn more about the Counselors of Real Estate and its a thousand credentials professionals, please visit cre.org. I'd like to recognize our sponsors for the What's Next webinar series, the Altus Group, Equus Capital Partners, and Real Capital Analytics. Thank you as always for your support. Also, you're encouraged to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, should you wish to submit a question. Your participation is welcomed and we'll answer as many questions as time allows. So today we're privileged and honored to have Frank Pina, CRE, as moderator of today's event. Invited to membership in the Councilors in 1990, Frank has, is managing director of Ager Port Property Advisors in Miami, Florida, actually based in Coral Gables, just outside Miami, where he focuses on real estate services for ports and related maritime industries. Frank will introduce our superb, exclusive, and global panel. Welcome, Frank. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. So today we've got a, a group of very experienced uh, logistics both service providers and operators. The first speaker will be Martin Dixon, who's the Director, Head of Research Products for Drury. Drury is a firm that was established in London in 1970. Today, they have become the most widely used and respected sources of impartial market insight, industry analysis, and advice, and have completed over 425 projects in 50 countries in the last 10 years. Martin uh, has more than 30 years strategic and operational experience in the shipping and supply chain management. Init with an initial background in the logistics operations with DHL and London-based department store group Harrods, he broadened into managerial roles in sales and marketing with German forwarding and logistics group DB Schenker. Immediately prior to joining Drury, he spent several years analyzing the container and shipping needs of shippers and logistics service providers for London-based journal, Containerization International. When he joined Drury in 2011, he took responsibility for development of its freight rate benchmarking services and other supply chain related activities. During this time, he expanded the scale and scope of Drury's spot rate benchmarking and launched the highly acclaimed Benchmarking Club. Martin was promoted to the board of Drury in 2013 and is responsible for the company's publishing interest of market report, reports and research products, as well as group-wide marketing and sales. Our Martin will be handling the shipping side of the logistics equation. Uh, we have uh, Beth Ann Branch. She is the chief commercial officer for the Alabama Port Authority. Uh, she is highly experienced in, in, on the port side of things, as well as shipping. She's the Chief Commercial Officer of Alabama Port Authority, globally experienced commercial strategist with more than 20 years in transportation and logistics. At the Port of Mobile, she is responsible for marketing effectiveness, creating and executing commercial strategies, and leading initiatives that establish strong commercial relationships. Before joining the Port of Mobile, she led marketing and business development activities at the Port of Oakland, 
which is one of the largest ports in the United States. And prior to that, she worked at ocean carrier Maersk, which is the largest shipping company in the world. in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, there she had responsibilities that range from yield management to pricing, business process design, and marketing. Uh, she's a passionate community volunteer uh, in such organizations as Habitat for Humanity, Students Rising Above, and Farm to Fight Hunger. And uh, last but certainly not least, we that's taking up the rail side of the industry is Nate Asplund. He is partner and president of Columbia Strategic Consulting Group. He brings a diverse international domestic career in transportation, logistics, and energy support industry. Company leadership roles and expertise in country management, startups, business development, and working in the public sector. Nate was CEO of two of the largest shortline regional railroads, RRVW in North Dakota, which operates 577 miles and is the leading non-class one grain railroad in the US. And here in Florida, although he's in the state of Texas, uh, he was uh, president of Florida East Coast Rail Railways, which is the largest regional railroad by volume and the most intermodally intensive railroad in the United States. He has served as vice president of BNSF Railway, which is one of our class one railroads in this country and has directed public-private partnership groups, which have successfully pioneered partnerships in the, sub in, the, excuse me, in the public sector to remedy multiple rail infrastructure choke points in the Midwest and Western US. Before BNSF, he was with Crowley Maritime Corporation. Responsibilities included marine support services for the oil and gas industry around the world. He recently served as chairman of the rail shippers Advisory Committee, which advises the, center, the Federal Surface Transportation Board. And with that, we go into our, our, our presentations, which starts with my four and a half minute one. Are we seeing, can you see the slide? Not yet. Denise. Let's get this presented. Perfect. So, uh, I'm going to give you a four and a half minute tour of the industry. The goals for today's webinar is to look at the state of infrastructure, overview of ports, railroad, and shipping. Where does property fit in this world of logistics? Issues, challenges, and opportunities for consideration, and a comprehensive presentation of logistics landscape for discussion, thought, identification of opportunities. Keep in mind when you're looking at this, if you're on the property sector, to, to look at it on how real estate can not only participate, but what the opportunities in real estate are to address the numerous challenges that are not going to go away in the logistics industry. So <clears throat> I need to talk a little bit uh, about infrastructure and the deficit that exists on a global basis. There's a $57 trillion global infrastructure deficit worldwide. This exceeds the value of, of global infrastructure today. And just in the US requires 1.6 trillion in the next five years, just to bring our infrastructure to acceptable levels. Now, yes, we've got an infrastructure package uh, bill that's been approved recently. Uh, but if you start, if you look closely at that infrastructure bill, between 492 and 547 billion of that goes into infrastructure. And of that, only 200 billion is earmarked for ports, airports, roads, and bridges. Uh, 
you're going to probably have this later so you can read through all the different areas where it's going but what's close and, and, and near to my heart are of course ports of the one trillion dollar infrastructure package only 17 billion or 1.7 percent is going into ports and into soft infrastructure there's 120 billion so only 55 percent approximately of the bill is going into hard and soft infrastructure to put that in perspective we're, we were allocating $17 billion to the ports industry in the United States. India is allocating $21 billion for their country. And in Singapore, one terminal, the Taos terminal, two us terminal, excuse me, is, is projected to cost over $20 billion. This is a very capital intensive industry and, and the infrastructure se sector is as well. So if you look at the Americas, North, Central, South, Caribbean, we're 47% behind where we should be, whereas the world is only 19% and Asia and Oceania, Oceania 10%. This, this gives us a very clear indication of the challenges we have ahead. So this is a typical, excuse me, this is a typical intermodal supply chain. Keep this in mind. The ports are in, in the middle. They're the most important sea land interface and, and node within this supply chain. But from sellers to buyers, this supply chain heavily dependent on land and land close to these points of distribution. So emerging logistics trends, which we're gonna hear of a lot today from our speakers and in our conversation, we'll discuss the cloud, blockchain technology, artificial intelligence, robotic and automation at ports, inevitable, it's called, it is happening. It's gonna happen even more so in the United States at an accelerated place, it has to. Last mile delivery, first mile, supply chain integration, and the need for more land and specialized green facilities to support all of this. <clears throat> so regardless of size and location, everybody's grappling with funding. A lot of this, in my opinion, is gonna be taken up by the private sector in the future, and that's gonna require a whole slew of things starting from restructuring restructuring of quasi-governmental agencies, for example, a port authority, uh, but even more so down and through the supply chain. Uh, maybe, not maybe, shifting from just in time to something more flexible with more flexible bandwidth to be able to deal with these disruptions that we've been experiencing. Capital, uh, private sector markets, being able to uh, participate in infrastructure funding, uh, in, in the government sector and, and how that would be structured. And also property being the largest underlying asset throughout the supply chain, uh, being able to be better monetized so that all of this can be financed in a more efficient fashion. So I introduced Mr. Uh, Martin Dixon, Beth Branch, Ms. Beth Branch and Nate Asplund on what uh, on the three different sectors in the in the logistics industry that'll be followed by an open panel discussion, Q and A addressing queries from the attendees, takeaways from the from myself, and concluding remarks from our chairman. So, oh, and this is for my friends Martin and Michelle. Sorry in Montreal and London, respectively. Winter in Miami. <laughs> so I will relinquish. And I would say, take it away, Martin. Okay, Frank, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so hopefully uh, you can see my first slide. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to provide you with Drury's outlook for the uh, container shipping supply chain. Um, and my starting point for that will be to firstly look at the outlook for the uh, global shipping market. Before we then look at the ports market and then some of the landside infrastructure trends. Okay, so firstly, starting on the outlook for the shipping markets, we, we uh, really can't um, make a, a start on this until we really um, uh, understand some of the underlying issues with regard to the current uh, degree of uh, disruption and congestion across the, uh, the container shipping supply chain. And so with this chart here, we've tried to map that. There's quite a lot of detail here. I'm sure you haven't got time to read through all of this. You can do that another time, but just uh, and many of this, much of this may be familiar to you, um, but just uh, recapping a little bit for you. So on the left hand side uh, here, we're looking at the root causes and then we move then to look at so some of the problems that's then uh, created, some of the symptoms of those problems. And on the right hand side, then we're looking at some of the early signs then of some return to, to normality um, as we as we go through um, into uh, 2022. So firstly, just looking at uh, the first phase, as we know, we go back to the beginning of the pandemic that started in the first uh, uh, early 2020. The first half of the year, trade collapsed um, as Asia locked down, and that's followed by uh, the Northern Hemisphere um, economies. And of course, then shipping capacity was then cut significantly to match that uh, contraction in demand. And we then saw a disruption then in terms of the positioning of empty container equipment, particularly on these very imbalanced trades, such as the eastbound, uh, such as the Trans-Pacific. Um, and that was the start of some of the disruption that we've seen since. Of course, then at the start of the, la the, second, of the uh, second half of last year, we saw a very sharp recovery, a recovery of uh, cargo demand that took uh, much of the uh, global supply chain by surprise and, much of, uh, and many uh, stakeholders were relatively ill-prepared uh, for that development. And a lot of the, the drivers of this uh, surge in demand was a, a big rise in e-commerce uh, e sales, as we saw consumer spending shift from uh, spend on services uh, to spending on consumer durables, through the, particularly through the course of the lockdown when people weren't able to get out and, and spend money then on services. Uh, that was supported by a lot of uh, government stimulus activity and we saw a lot of restocking activity still taking place today, actually, uh, particularly following the big uh, rundown of stocks in the in the first half of, of last year. And then on the supply side that added to many of these woes in the contraction of, of available capacity was various incidents such as the blockage of the Suez Canal uh, and the outbreak of, um, of COVID and some key uh, um, hubs and ports, particularly in South China. And then we've had extreme weather conditions that have also impacted uh, productivity and availability of key ports and hubs. And the impact of that has then been seen in uh, very much reduced ports productivity and therefore big queues of ships waiting um, to, to get berths. Um, and therefore we've seen a big contraction then in the available capacity of the shipping fleet because a lot of it is tied up and unable to be used. And we had the same effect therefore on the container equipment fleet where we've seen equipment turnaround cycle times heavily extended and therefore the availability of that fleet significantly impacted. And therefore big impacts then on shippers and cargo owners um, who have seen their freight rates soar, uh, access to capacity uh, be severely constrained. But there are signs though that there are the, of early signs of certain indicators that suggest that there's some easing taking place, although it is uh, quite limited at the moment. So, for example, US inventories to sales ratios has been starting to improve. Durable goods sales relative to that of uh, spend on services, we think is probably peaked now. And we'd we'll like to see some uh, correction, gradual correction there over time, a bit more of that uh, on a, a bit later. Um, and we're also um, starting to see um, a slight rise in the, in the size of the global fleet, of the, sort of the inactive fleet. Some other indicators, I think, to look for that haven't quite emerged yet uh, would be better metrics on port waiting times. We've still got a big problem there and improved uh, carrier schedule reliability. No sign of that right now. And lower freight rates. Well, we've seen a slight fall in spot rates, but not anything of any significance. Um, and also the investment in the container equipment fleet waning 
um, early signs of that perhaps, but I think uh, probably more more of that uh, more of that to come next next year. So we are seeing some signs of some easing, but it's very very early. We think that the current situation will continue throughout much of next year, and in fact, probably into 2023, although we'll see some improvement as we go through uh, those those periods. Okay, so this next chart is then looking at the outlook for um, container port uh, uh, global throughput. So this brown line is then tracking our baseline um, uh, historical trend uh, and forecast. And you see these dotted lines, which are looking at a, a optimistic or slightly less pessimistic uh, scenario there. So the and what we're tracking here is the year on year percentage change on a on a quarter by quarter basis, if that makes sense to you. So uh, for this year, we're forecasting that the uh, global port handling will increase by just over 8%. Um, and that will bring, by the end of the year, port handling up to around 7% above the pre-pandemic level. So it shows you the degree and speed and pace of recovery we've seen through the course of this year. Now, for next year, we are projecting an uplift of around just over 5% in overall trade patterns there. Um, but there are a number of downside risks connected with that. Rising inflationary pressures could lead to um, uh, some tightening of monetary policy by central banks. Uh, that, that could be more aggressive than perhaps uh, the market needs, potentially derailing some economic recovery. Um, and uh, we expect to see some shift back uh, from spend on consumer durables back to services. That could have an effect, but we think actually overall proportional spend on durables remain pretty strong because we think that the long-term evolution of more hybrid working, more home working, will see um, consumer durable spending uh, likely to remain pretty strong. So obviously any dampening effect on cargo demand outlook would see a quicker correction to the current level of overall supply chain disruption. If we turn then to look at uh, container port capacity, what we're looking at here is our projections for a global port capacity uh, shown by these brown bars compared with our projections of the same capacity that we made a year ago. And you can see that there has been uh, some improvements in terms of the overall capacity projection. Um, but firstly, Overall, over the next five years, we're projecting that the, on the demand side, we'll see cargo demand rising, an average annual rate of around 5% over that period. Um, what we expect with capacity growth is that whilst it has improved, which is something to be um, very buoyant about, the pace of growth of capacity at the moment is still projected to be some way below the growth that we're seeing, um, likely to see uh, in actual trade. So we think that the, the growth of uh, container port capacity will average around 2.5% a year. So that's half the growth that you're seeing projected for the, the overall trade. And so the impact of that will, will see high utilisation levels rising, we think, from a global average of around 67% today to around 75%. Now, at a, at a, at a terminal or port level, that level of utilisation is nothing too concerning. But at a global level, it could be, uh, particularly at a time, but we're already experiencing very high levels of congestion, albeit we know that a lot of that really relates to operational issues um, at the moment due to the overall congestion across the container shipping supply chain. So in terms of physical uh, and digital infrastructure uh, investment, whilst much of the logistics industry focus recently has been on optimizing the last mile, that is the delivery of goods to the consumer to support the growing e-commerce trade. Um, but the recent global supply chain disruption is leading many players to look much more carefully uh, at the first mile, that is the movement of goods from producer to distribution center. And of course, achieving end-to-end -end supply chain visibility cannot be achieved if the system does not look therefore beyond the reception base of the distribution center. So key success factors are very high quality logistics infrastructure, comprising a very effective road and rail network, efficient ports uh, and efficient border clearance. But there's also a requirement for very high quality digital infrastructure, 
particularly extensive internet and global uh, uh, mobile networks, and also uh, digital supply chain networks as well. So in terms of the opportunities for, for growth, for particularly for those ports and, uh, and conurbations seeking to seize opportunities, in terms of physical infrastructure, there's clearly fast rising demand for warehouse space, uh, driven by this e big e-commerce boom. Now that aligns to a large extent with the vertical integ integration strategies of many ports and also global uh, cont uh, container terminal operators. And this shift to um, e-commerce is boosting the port-centric logistics model, although obviously that requires a populous hinterlands uh, and also access to large land resources. So in terms of the digital infrastructure, uh, we're seeing a growing re requirement uh, for efficient uh, data transfer and improved visibility across the supply chain. Cargo owners need to have end-to-end -end visibility across their supply chains. And this means uh, container terminal operating systems being able to interface with multiple stakeholders, whether that's uh, carriers, forwarders, transport providers, customers, and other agencies. So really the, the key takeaway here is that future, the, the failure to invest in digital connectivity could result in loss of physical uh, connectivity. Also, there is a need to connect the investments that are made at a port level with what's happening in terms of the supporting inland infrastructure. So what we've done some recent analysis, which will actually be published at the end of this month in Drury's Ports and Terminals Insight, um, in which we've looked at the development of ports on the east coast of the, of, of, uh, of the US. Um, and in this chart here, we're looking at each of these main ports and we're comparing the uh, maximum vessel size calling at these ports um, over the last few years. And we're comparing between the main ports, which are shown on the left, and what we define as challenger ports uh, on the right. And what we have noticed is that despite some investments already in channel dredging um, and a chronic congestion across many of the main US uh, gateway ports, these challenger ports have, have been relatively unsuccessful in luring carriers away from the major gateways, or indeed in attracting big ships, as we're showing here um, in this chart. Traffic growth also at US East Coast challenger ports has generally been much weaker than it has been um, at the main gateway ports. And the exception there uh, would be Philadelphia. So the inability of challenger ports to lure carriers away from major gateways to utilize their relatively uncongested uh, terminals cannot be attributed to marine constraints alone. Rather, it's really, it's a combination of strong contractual commitments that ties players to existing arrangements, the ge geographically fixed nature of investments along the supply chain, obviously warehouses is an obvious example there, and constrained intermodal and trucking capacity at some of these challenger ports, but the same characteristics exist, exist um, elsewhere too. So it means that, that for many uh, cargo owners, there is very low flexibility in respect to port of entry and choice. It is evident that at challenger ports that upgrade um, marine and terminal infrastructure um, is simply the first step in capturing uh, market share. So in order for these ports to secure services and boost cargo volumes, the challenger ports must also increase the capacity and capability of the inland transportation linkages and work with local stakeholders to develop warehousing and logistics facilities in the primary hinterlands. Okay, so just some key takeaway points from, from what I've uh, gone through just now. So we're projecting overall growth, and uh, annual growth uh, of around 5% a year over the next few years to 2025. Um, and although the strength of the recovery has accelerated capacity expansion, we, we think that the current projected growth of that capacity will not be sufficient to keep pace with the growth of uh, cargo demand. And therefore we think uh, that uh, the, the congestion crisis will not be resolved immediately um, over the near term. Uh, well, I haven't uh, mentioned too much about the financial strength of the sector, but certainly the global uh, container terminal operators have actually seen 
uh, relatively modest declines in, in margins uh, through the course of last year and the course of the pandemic. But what we are seeing, though, is a big increase in digital um, uh, investment in, to invest in digitization as ways of improving productivity and connectivity across the supply chain. That is key, but there needs to be much more. But also, finally, um, it is critical that landside infrastructure investment um, is, is therefore key to providing wider port choice and reducing the ongoing risk of port congestion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. That was very, very interesting. And I invite Beth to give her presentation now on the port side of the equation. Sure, let me, um, let me try to share my screen here. Oh boy, let's see. Is that up? Can everyone see? Perfect. Super. Okay, let's see if I can get it going. Great. Um, um, Martin, I'm going to have a lot of things to uh, dovetail from what you've um, certainly said. I would like to um, thank the uh, Councils of Real Estate for including the um, Alabama Port Authority and Port of Mobile uh, in this discussion. It's obviously very timely and very critical. Um, what I'd like to do is to start on, on, on a more micro level, and then um, which will be centered on the Port of Mobile and some of the things that we're seeing here, and then um, expand that into a more um, into a more macro level. Um, the first thing that I will say is that I'm going to build exactly on what Martin just said, which is dredging alone does not attract um, business. Um, it is a combination of multiple things, and here at the Port of Mobile. Uh, just to benchmark that for you, we're currently at around 500,000 uh, units that we move in terms of containers. Um, uh, in 2021, we'll uh, wind up at about 20, uh, about 500,000, 520,000. We have ambitions within 10 years to be at 2 million. Um, you don't get there just by dredging your channel to 50 feet so that you can attract larger vessels. Um, you also have to have in place um, several other um, elements, uh, one of them very related to uh, real estate, which is the warehousing and distribution capabilities for first and, and final mile. And especially with a port like Mobile that does not have a large consumer base, uh, battling for those discretionary markets inland um, makes it really, really critical for us to have the warehousing and distribution as well as the inland uh, rail functionality and, um, and product and services. So, uh, Martin, I think that was a really um, good point that you made. Uh, the Port of Mobile is uh, 11th overall in size in the United States. Um, we're a fairly diversified um, port, so that 11th in size includes all of our tonnage. Um, and it's a, a fairly diversified um, port that you'll see in uh, just a moment. We have our own uh, railroad that we operate. It's a short line railroad, not one of the large class ones, but a short um, line railroad. And our port complex encompasses about 3,700 acres, um, some directly at the port complex on the water and others um, that is a little further uh, away from the, the main port, about 12 miles away. Um, so that's sort of the uh, general overview of um, the Port of Mobile. And as I mentioned, it's one of the most diversified ports that I have ever um, seen. We uh, not only handle containers, and we have a fairly new container terminal that was built um, back in the uh, first year of operation was 2009, uh, which is um, a newborn in the in the world of uh, containerized shipping, um, but we also have very very heavy into um, bulk commodities such as coal. Um, this is the metallurgical coal that's used to manufacture steel, not the um, stuff that fires um, plants. Um, containerized um, uh, shipping. We also have some very very specialized steel um, products that we handle. Um, forest products, as well as automotive. And the reason that I bring this up and even highlight it for this group is that diversified operations require very different um, land needs um, and land uses. So when you are looking at your overall port, you do have to consider that something like a finished vehicle automotive roll-on, roll-off facility is essentially a giant parking lot. 
Um, we have just completed a 60 acre, roughly 60 acre um, row row facility. Um, it is waterside and then it's got 7,500 parking spots essentially. That's very, very different than um, a container port where the efficiency and the productivity and the throughput, uh, really the capacity of a container uh, terminal is very reliant on land, but also how you utilize that land. So in the case of a container terminal, uh, you can do a reach stacker type of operation uh, with um, you know trucks going to each uh, container row and, and picking the containers, or you can have a, a more automated um, uh, system uh, or operation that um, includes um, different kinds of equipment. And the differences there are, uh, just as an example, with a, with a less automated uh, type of operation, you can move about 2,700 uh, containers per acre. Uh, and with a more automated one, you start to get in the 4,400 um, plus containers per acre. So you can see the real um, criticality of planning and land use uh, across a port system uh, when you're looking at um, what you can do um, with that land and how you can increase, um, increase capacity. Uh, I put this slide up here really just to talk about uh, two critical, we have, we think there are three things here at the port that really um, make us stand out. Um, being connected, being invested in, and um, obviously we're growing as a result of those first two inputs. Um, but every port that is going to be successful has to have the first two things. Um, they have got to be um, connected uh, to rail. They've got to be connected to the interstate system. Um, in our case, we happen to be connected two and a half miles down the road to an airport. Um, and we also have a little bit of um, uh, an interesting um, connectivity um, platform because we have about 15,000 miles of inland waterways that gets us into the interior of the country. Um, we also have a very um, unique marine highway here that is a railroad that runs on the water down to Mexico. Um, and uh, so that's a, a kind of a different uh, niche uh, type of um, operation. Over the last 10 years and into the next uh, couple of years, support will have invested about $1.3 billion um, here. Um, and that is um, fairly small um, compared to other port complexes uh, where the infrastructure needs and the infrastructure and development of real estate is so critical and so expensive um, that all ports have got massive, massive um, CapEx uh, types of programs. I'm kind of going to go from the, the micro um, uh, focus on uh, just on mobile to uh, uh, blowing it up a little bit. And I think Martin um, obviously captured a lot of this, but um, if I could describe what is going on in the supply chain worldwide, but certainly in the United States right now, in two words, we are experiencing a meltdown. Um, there are challenges on every single front um, from the end to end of um, the supply chain. Uh, you are all very aware and have seen the images of vessels at anchor. Um, what they don't tell you is that outside of Anchorage, there's also this thing called drifting, which means that vessels are just out in the ocean without any spot to anchor. Um, there are land constraints at every port. Um, if you look at Southern California, um, they're, they're inland markets now. Um, a lot of the distribution and warehousing that is serving um, California is actually in Arizona. Um, that's how far out. Uh, the land constraints have pushed um, the supply chain and the distribution and warehousing schedule. And I'm not going to call it reliability. I'm just going to call it unreliability, because if you have the number of container ships sitting off the coast waiting for a berth, you can imagine what that does to a schedule. Equipment is out of position. Chassis are at short. Uh, container dwell times are really high. Um, that impacts the capacity and throughput of a terminal. And it's really just a snowball um, that continues um, to happen. Uh, add on top of that aging infrastructure in many ports. And there are no easy or fast um, fixes. Operating 24-7 in California is not going to fix this. Because if you don't have the drivers and if you don't have the workers in the distribution centers, it doesn't matter, you can't pick up a container at three o'clock in the morning. Um, so there, there's nothing easy, nothing fast, um, but there is some good news, I think, on um, the horizon. We'll get there in a second. 
Um, so why is all this important? Obviously, um, a very much more simplified version of uh, the supply chain uh, than the one that Frank um, put up and showed. Uh, but from supplier to consumer, right smack in the middle of all of that is distribution. And um, if we are to get product um, to the consumer, um, there are many, many elements that have to flow um, through this. And right now, uh, logistics and distribution is severely um, stressed. Um, and it is, um, if anyone has tried to order most anything uh, lately, uh, you'll know you are feeling uh, very um, uh, seriously the, the impacts of this. Just another visual, I, you know, there's a, a little website out there called Vessel Finder, and um, I like to go to it only because it reminds me every day how massive global trade is. Of course, I've highlighted Mobile there in the middle of the U.S. map, but um, if you look at this, this was just a snapshot taken a couple of, uh, couple of months ago, but it, it sort of gives you a really quick overview of uh, what's going on uh, in global trade at any given time. I will note that the blue arrows are fishing boats, not container ships or LNG or other types of vessels. But this just gives you a sense of the breadth of, um, of global trade. Um, it also gives you a sense of um, if everything is not moving efficiently, when all of these vessels arrive at port, you wind up with what we have today. And what we have today um, is a lot of landslide and berth congestion. Um, I am not picking on any of my um, uh, fellow ports here. We want all of them to be moving um, efficiently and effectively. And this uh, phenomena is, is uh, almost every port is experiencing this. I will say that Mobile is not, but that's for some different reasons. Um, but there are vessels at anchor almost everywhere in the United States right now. As of two days ago, there were 85 container vessels outside of um, LA Long Beach, the San Pedro um, complex, uh, waiting um, for an anchor, uh, for a, waiting an anchor um, for a berth. Um, in addition to that, um, the number of days at anchor between LA and Long Beach is anywhere from 16 to 22 days right now. Just to give you a, a little bit of context of what that means, Typically, a vessel from Asia coming to LA Long Beach can make that voyage in less than the number of days that they're sitting at anchor right now. So it's a it's a quite dramatic um, set of circumstances that have implications up and down the supply chain. Um, you've seen um, railroads, um, and I'm sure that um, Nate may speak to this, but um, both Western railroads at, at some point in time have been so overwhelmed um, with cargo and cargo that's not being picked up that they've stopped service out of the West Coast into Chicago. Um, those are really dramatic um, moves. Um, but it's not just a Southern California. The East Coast also has quite a few challenges here. Um, Savannah, which is one of the most efficiently run um, ports, um, I would say almost anywhere in the world. Um, they have been very um, smart um, in terms of how they've grown and they are very efficient and very productive. Um, two days ago, three days ago, they had 22 vessels waiting for a berth. Um, it's, it's really quite, um, quite unheard of. Um, I'll also say that one of the things that's, you know, on the land side, it's not just the vessels waiting to get in, but once they get in, how long is it taking them to clear out? Um, and that's taking um, really quite days um, in this environment. Other things that have really uh, been impacting the supply chain, of course, and this isn't necessarily port centric, but it, it does uh, impact all elements and nodes uh, along the supply chain. Everyone is um, very aware of production shortages, in particular, the, uh, the chips. Uh, one calls, I think that was the New York Times that, uh, that coined it, but they said uh, that 2021 was the year that just in time was late. Um, and I think that I would um, say that that is uh, a very real reality within um, the supply chain. It's forcing a lot of um, evaluation of supply chains and how they need to be changed up. Um, a little bit, and I think that, that that Martin has addressed that very much, and I think Nate is also going to talk a little bit about some of the some of that things with the rail. Uh, we've also had factory shutdowns um, that have impacted um, the flow of goods from uh, from point A to point B. So, you know, it really has been quite a um, quite a year. 
Um, I will say that it's not all um, doom and gloom. I think there is some change on the horizon. There aren't easy or, or fast fixes, but there is some change on the horizon. Um, I'm going to use, a, you know, there's a lot of things up here on the slide, whether it's around end-to-end um, information and visibility to the supply chain. I think that's a really crit- critical thing that's that's going to start happening, whether that's blockchain or other uh, other types of um, things that come in. Um, you know, I think that we won't see globalization going away, but companies who do rely on raw material feedstock into their factories, um, you know, maybe they're not going to have them so far away now. Maybe they're going to be a little closer um, to where they are. Or maybe they're going to be in South America instead of Asia. Maybe they're going to be, you know, so I think there's going to be a lot of changes there. And then, you know, this whole um, uh, shift to everyone um, working from home in their pajamas uh, and ordering things online has been, uh, you know, we can't really under uh, understate that. Uh, someone did say to me, if everyone would just shop, stop shopping for a week, we could supply, uh, 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 solve the existing uh, supply chain issues. But um, that's a, a bit tongue in cheek. It's obviously much more um, serious than that. I'll use an example um, of uh, my own experience. Uh, Frank mentioned I just moved from San Francisco in the Bay Area to um, to Mobile, Alabama. And when I was in San Francisco and I ordered a package on Amazon, it was on my doorstep within two hours. When I order a package in Mobile, I'm waiting between three and five days for it to come. That is all about distribution network. That is all about real estate. It is about having urban fulfillment centers in that have been developed vertically in dense urban populations. Um, it's about maybe not having that fulfillment center uh, near Mobile. Maybe it's near Birmingham or Atlanta or somewhere else. Um, so these types of shifts are very, very dramatic. And I do think that they're going to change uh, quite a bit the um, warehousing and logistics um, uh, landscape over the next uh, few years. I know here in Alabama, um, in the last um, year, um, they have made four announcements of uh, four different facilities, um, including a new international crosstalk um, on um, about, I think it's about 650 um, million, uh, 650,000 square feet um, outside of Montgomery. So, you know, these are real Titanic shifts that are happening, and I think that the industry is 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 has to change in order to uh, to accommodate this. So, just in um, wrapping up here, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about to this group the capital investments required, the infrastructure, and Frank really led with I think, um, you know, when we look at it, we think that one point seven percent of this infrastructure bill is going to go to ports. We're all rather cringing um, because the infrastructure's um, needs at ports are massive in the billions and billions of dollars. And strategic land use planning, and also very importantly, collaboration is really critical in this environment. Um, if I look at the um, if I look at the uh, capex programs of, of various ports, I mentioned that we've we've spent about one point three billion in the last uh, let's say call it ten years and into the next couple of years. Uh, we also have about one point five billion plus capex needs in going forward um, as well. Um, but if you look at the port of um, New York and New Jersey, for instance, they've got a they, they have a ten point five billion dollar capex program. They're repairing five wharfs alone at a cost of anywhere between five and twenty billion dollars. That's just twenty billion dollars. That's more than the entire seventeen billion in the infrastructure bill that will um, be going to ports. You look at the Georgia Ports Authority. They have got a three hundred, uh, excuse me, a three billion dollar capex program. They've just finished a two hundred twenty million dollar um, investment in a rail project. Um, that to Martin's point, South Carolina has just brought on, on a new terminal. That new terminal costs one point eight billion dollars. Um, Virginia Ports Authority again a billion dollars in capex, um, including you know three hundred twenty million dollars that was invested in their Virginia International Gateway. The needs are huge, and it this is just port infrastructure. Now, along with that port infrastructure, we have all of the warehousing and distribution. And ports, I can tell you, 
will be partnering with the private sector to do this. I will use an example here at the Port of Mobile to bring it back to a micro level. Um, we have about 124 acres adjacent to our container terminal. We have to think very carefully how to develop that industrial property. But what we do know is that we will have to do that with a private sector partner because we do not have the capital to be able to, promote, to, to develop that. So. Those are the types of things that ports have to think about in terms of private proctor, private, private public um, uh, um, uh, deals to get um, certain um, things done. The other thing that I'll say is that um, I think that when it comes to rail, which is critically, critically important to the growth and to the really the well-being of any um, of any port, um, is that one has to be very um, collaborative and very strategic in the way they go after grant monies. So for instance, um, if um, I am working with a railroad to bring intermodal service um, into the Port of Mobile, um, and we're working with the state on a project um, to do this, we have to be really careful about um, partnering, right? Because if the if the port has its own rail needs and we have intermodal rail needs, then we have to make sure that we're not all just going for state money or federal money all at the same time because we will shoot ourselves in the foot. We really have to align across our um, supply chain partners and stakeholders in order to make the most and to get the most and optimize the money for infrastructure that's out there. So. Um, those are my comments on um, on ports, and I think I hand it back to you now, don't I, Frank? Yes, thank you very much, Beth, for that very comprehensive overview of what's going on at the Port of Mobile and in the port sector itself. And now to bring it up, uh, we're going to ask Nate to give us the high-level uh, assessment of the railroad industry. Frank, thanks a million. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thanks for the opportunity and great discussions with Martin and Beth. And mine will be probably more tactical, more small down to earth level because I'm a railroad guy and that's kind of what we do. We love to talk about boxcars and Tommy the Tank Engine, but we focus on the real execution side of how if we can get out of this quagmire that is truly, truly a meltdown. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit on one slide, give you a flavor of the North American rail industry in the last 10, 20 years, what has happened with high level growth, some of the changes of the industry of its cargo mix and some of its direction forward. Then secondly, I call it when two worlds collide is mega ships and mega trains at that port uh, uh, nexus, it's very difficult. And we've seen the symptoms that, that Martin and Beth noted as, as well as Frank. And then, possibly a, a plotting a course forward. It's already, some of the green shoots are already happening of, an, of a method and a, an approach to go from better distribution, better fulfillment uh, in, in line with um, environmental concerns of uh, lower CO2 production, as well as satisfying those, um, those uh, uh, Amazon customers in Mobile, Alabama, so that's quick, five, five days. <laughs> So real quick, um, this might be a little bit of an eye chart for some of you, but I wanted to try to put it on one page. If you look back at the rail industry in the early part of this century, yes, I'm going back, 2000 to 2014, we kind of call that the great compromise period. Um, rails finally got to where they had productivity, uh, cost improvements, service improvements, capacity improvements, where they were able to really put capital into their enterprises. They raised some of the rates that they received from the better value they offered, but they had some really great results. Um, volume overall between 20, 2014 went up 11% in a very um, old, large scale industry. That's a very big jump in volume. But take a look, intermodal was up by almost 50%. Big, big success. Carload was actually down during the period. Um, the rails versus truck gained 500 basis points or 5% growth in market share of overland uh, ton miles over that period of time, which was a great accomplishment, making good, some good progress. 
Since about 14 to about now was the PSR or precision scheduled railroading optimization uh, phase of our industry. Um, larger trains, um, optimizing locomotive power, optimizing headcount and crews, um, rationalizing lanes, uh, and, and significantly improved profitability. However, volume is down, um, down 7% over that five-year period. Intermodal growth significantly shrunk to only 2% growth in intermodal. And cargo continue to go down. Uh, Beth mentioned coal. Coal has been a very significant impact in the U.S. and Canadian rail industry. Our volume of coal is down by almost 50%. From the peak of 2006 and that's a lot of stranded assets a lot of contraction that the rail industry had to to deal with during the psr era before we hit COVID, um, of the gains of five percent market share three percent was given back uh, they lost three hit 300 basis points between 14 and 18 to truck some of that because of the declining coal in uh 2020 uh COVID impact our overall volume was down seven percent which isn't that bad and intermodal only dropped 2%. So the intermodal uh, service provided very needed capacity and capability during that tough time in last year. This year, I call it crossroads. So precision scheduled railroading collides with a very unscheduled world. That's tough. Volatility and unpredictable supply chain hit an optimized rail network and it was very difficult for the railroads to respond quickly to upsize of these, what I would call the pig in the python scenario of all this volume coming at one time. I'm not being critical, it's been tough. I know a lot of my colleagues in the rail industry are doing everything they possibly can to be able to get volumes up. It's just been, as, Mark, as Martin and Beth noted and, and Frank, it's just been a very tough, tough period to get through. Um, Year-to-date volumes up almost 7%. In fact, if you take that to the latest week of reporting, it's about 8%. But I've got some concerns. Intermodal has struggled during third quarter. Um, year over year, it's down 2.9% in third quarter. Um, one would expect with the need for capacity, um, that could be higher. And the other thing that's of concern is the domestic intermodal segment, the big 53-foot containers and trailers, that's um, off almost 6% in the third quarter, which is, is a concern. And I know the industry is doing all it can to, to get back up on track. Um, but when that when we have such a rationing and a, and a tremendous demand for, for overland uh, capacity to move freight, and you're down almost 6% in your domestic segment, that, that's a concern that we all are really working hard on. So when two worlds collide is just what Martin and, and Beth said. Um, if you all look up, there's a great uh, website out there called The Visual Capitalist. These uh, men and women are really great at taking economic data, operating data, and making it something that can put your head around uh, proportionally and so forth. So this is really just showing the bottleneck in LA Long Beach. Um, on average in September, about 29,000 uh, containers arrived each day, and your offtake at LA was only 18,000. So you've got big, big ships. Um, the other thing that Martin and Beth mentioned, the challenge in Southern Cal, and I'm gonna kind of focus a little bit on Southern California because it's 40% of the overall import volume of the US. The big challenge is, is those big ships come in and 85% of the cargo capacity of that ship is handled. It's not like up and down the east and in the Gulf of Mexico where there's multiple port calls. They're moving you know, 80, 85 percent of that ship's capacity comes at them one time, offloading the imports and bringing the exports and empties mm -hmm. back on. A huge burden for those 12 terminals in, in L.A. This is a photo of Hobart. It's the BNSF's um, facility that is not on dock. It's about 11 miles up 710. And the challenge I think we have with all of this volume coming into Southern Cal um, is doing everything at once. We talked about the port cluster of logistics. Um, the Inland Empire of California 
the total square foot of the distribution cluster is 1.5 billion square feet. A lot of that is cross docking off of international containers mm -hmm. through cross docks onto domestic trailers and domestic containers that then go out. A lot of it's deferred uh, postponement, uh, fulfillment, warehousing, value add, taking and merging multiple international origins and building a, a, a complete domestic load that goes inland to a particular DC. A lot of activity is going on in a very, very small place. 17,000 dray trucks is the fleet size. So you've got complexity at your 12 terminals on LA, on Long Beach. You've got complexity of the inland intermodal facilities, um, Hobart, San Bernardino, the UP facility, all of them very challenged with variety, uncertainty, volatility of the in gate and the out gate and loading and emptying the train. It's when two worlds are colliding. It's happening in a very concentrated place. We also have the issues of uh, changes in labor considerations in California, considerations of indirect source emissions within those DCs and warehouses in the Inland Empire, a, a call for zero emission dray trucks, and just very difficult place to, to, to do all of this and it really wasn't designed for Martin's mega ships. It is very, very taxing, and we're not having enough offtake to match when those worlds collide. So my thought, and this is my own personal thought, I, I ran the FEC. I was very big with BNSF of solving a lot of these choke points. I'm a, I'm a resident nerd. I think about this all the time. I have no hobbies. But how do you how do you satisfy this offtake conundrum? How do we de facto work together? And a lot of this for all of you in the real estate side is so real estate centric, like Beth was mentioning. How can we start digging out of this mess and doing it on an act on an action oriented basis? Mm -hmm. Here's my thought. Um, I believe that and it's already starting is direct movement of containerized imports by double stack trains either on dock or near dock to off dock inland terminals in the vicinity of users is an essential call for urgency. This could not happen effectively until we had such trade volume that justifies dedicated intense shorter distance trains. And I can translate that for you if you'd like, but you need to have enough volume over shorter distances to justify the train start and the, the on-time performance, the lifting, all the work that goes into it. If you've got short trains and short distances, it's very hard to make it pencil. But given all the volume, you now have that opportunity. So this is really an evolution of what's happened of other inland ports. We started with Alliance Texas, South Dallas, Logistics Park Chicago, Global Four, Logistics Park Kansas City, those are way inland and they're for very large urban areas. I only talked about three urban areas right here, DFW, Chicago in the vicinity and Kansas City. These need to be set up in regional areas in my estimation throughout the country to take this massive amount of cargo hitting one place and start sequentially deconsolidating, not trying to do all the work at one place that's very difficult to do from every aspect of gate hours, labor availability, productivity per square foot, all the things that you guys have talked about. Um, so then around that would be the distribution clusters. All of you have seen Alliance Texas, you've seen around LPC what happens. Those would be built around that shorter distance intermodal location. Uh, great opportunity for partnering with development entities, with real estate experts to make that happen. And I mentioned, look what has to be, uh, today, the Inland Empire is 1.5 billion square feet. I'm not talking about replacing it, but there's no more room. As Beth said, it's going all the way to Arizona. And then having been involved in projects to try to get new facilities permitted and built in Southern California, 
it's very, very difficult. When I was with BNSF, we worked for 12 years to try to get a near dock facility permitted and approved called SKIG. We had electric cranes, we had LEED certified um, technologies, the whole thing, and it never got done. So it's very difficult to, to be able to move the needle inland, in the inland empire. And then they're talking about zero emission drain trucks in the very near future. I, I, I advocate that, I believe in it. I think it's what we need to aspire to but I don't know if any of you've been to Daimler or your Navistar or pack car dealer and say, I want a zero emission truck. Can you, can you deliver it to me? They don't exist. So it's a challenge there in Southern Cal. Two examples, what's happening. Beth mentioned what, um, what Griff Lynch is doing with GPA, Georgia Port Authority. So mm -hmm. they don't have 12 terminals. They got one. And they built this big rail facility that Beth mentioned to get that freight out of there. And they've developed their own inland ports at Chatsworth, Georgia, Rocky Mount, uh, North Carolina are some early phases. In addition, GPA um, responded to the emergency, wrote a white paper for the White House Supply Chain Task Force, sent it up to them, and they are gonna be doing pop-up yards to get some of those long drain containers out of Savannah, get them closer to the market, which is what we're talking about. And those pop-up yards, will be functioning and handling freight next month. So mm -hmm. get something done quick and plan for the future. Utah in an Inland Port Authority working with LA Long Beach and Union Pacific is doing the same thing. So that I think it's such huge volume and constrained locations. Can we diversify that, have better fulfillment for our end users? We've got better labor availability and dray fleet availability in those diverse locations than versus doing it all in one place. The other side, I think, from the rail side is diversify the ports and sourcing. For Beth's mm -hmm. point, we have nearshoring coming to North America that allows them to have the uh, distribution clusters that can merge uh, nearshoring origins with Asian SKUs as well. Freight, rail, and public policy dovetail. Uh, they do uh, much better um, use. It's a private right of way. We've got capital to to invest. Um, rail produces 67% uh, less CO2 per ton mile than highway trucking, lots of mobility goals and some good stuff. Whilst there's not unlimited funding, we do have some things that have come. Uh, uh, Frank and Beth mentioned the 17 billion uh, that's part of the bill that was signed into law on Monday for ports and waterways. On top of that is 66 billion for rail, about Roughly half of that, um, maybe a little more than half, is going to largely go to passenger, but there's still a lot of things we can do for multimodal. And last thing, and I will conclude quickly, the other thing that happened in the infra bill is to allow formulatic highway trust money that comes to the states to be able to apply, be applied for multimodal projects. It used to be a 10% maximum, and this uh, five-year fully authorized bill increases that to 30%. So as we look at highway connectors, um, all of that that ties in multimodal rail and port, there's a new opportunity. However, the caveat that Beth mentioned is it's gonna require great coordination, open, openness and transparency and collaboration between entities so we can do this on a corridor basis and get the biggest bang for the buck. So for that, Frank, I'm going to conclude. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you all this afternoon. Excellent, Nate. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the overview. And we'll have a panel discussion now. So I'll start it off. Uh, uh, Martin, if you will, if you can't, you, certainly you can, if you will. Um, in the real estate business, we, we think of occupancy, the higher the occupancy, the better. A perfect occupancy in an office building, for example, might be 95, 96%. There's always tenants moving in and out. Uh, but in the on the port side, it's a little different. And you and you look at utilization levels. And after a certain point, you start going into the operating in the realm of chaos because there's peaks and, and troughs. Uh, could you explain a little bit about that to, to the audience on how you need to reach optimal utilization not exceeded 
and where, generally speaking, the industry finds itself today in major gateway ports? Well, I think, as I said in the um, in my presentation, the the uh, the average occupancy is below seventy percent uh, at the moment across um, it, in, in normal times. Um, and uh, we, we expect that to rise uh, over the next few years, given the fact that the uh, we, we don't think that the investment in capacity will keep pace with the the growth growth in cargo. Um, and I think the I think the more broader thing though is to emphasise that really if you look across the whole container shipping supply chain, um, it's it's been operated for for many many years uh, to minimise cost and to make shipping cheap. So you can import goods from all over the world, particularly from the uh, workshop of the world of China, and bring these goods in, into markets at very low cost. Um, but, the, but the system has not been built for resilience. So it's right. been built for very, very predictable trade patterns. You talk about the volatility, but, but frankly, when it comes to cargo demand, uh, those patterns are very predictable. And they over the years, they have uh, the, the ability to predict that through using algorithms um, and, and the like to, to in order for, um, for that visibility of what's coming down the supply chain to be very clear has been there. Um, and therefore, companies have got used to, to, to running down the, the facilities and the capacity that they have to manage a very predictable flow. But of course, what's happened is that we, we, that predictability is completely gone in the last two years. And we've seen this whipsawing of trade and therefore, really, these benchmarks then of what is a typical uh, required utilization, a target utilization, these days really is very hard, very hard to determine because you don't know how much slack to build into your system then in order to have the capacity and capability to support uh, these um, uh, these fluctuations. So, so is, is it uh, fair to say that an optimal utilization level at, at a major gateway port would be somewhere in the vicinity of 70, 75%? And if you exceed that, you start looking at problems? Yeah, I think but it, it's very difficult to make those kind of generalizations, I think. And I think Beth will probably be able to give you a bit more on that too, uh, frankly, because it really depends on the makeup of the ports and the, the way the structure of that port and the, and the terminal and and the constraints uh, that it may have. So whereas one uh, terminal or port can operate at a relatively high uh, level of intensity, others probably can't just because of the restrictions that they may have. So I think it's difficult to make those kind of generalizations. Yeah. If, you look at the, if you look at the shipping fleet itself uh, on the ship side, you typically you would want to have utilization rates on your head haul trade at around 90%. Um, and again, that doesn't leave you a lot of uh, slack if you if the um, if if you have a a cha big change in in, in trade volumes. Right. But Beth, why, yeah. perhaps you could you can provide more on on those utilization levels at terminals. Sure. So, um, am I on, on mute? Um, when we're operating here, and granted, we're a much smaller containerized mm -hmm. port, right? I think there's more cargo sitting off in uh, ships at anchor right now than we when, than we might do in a year. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we are at about when we hit 80%, 80 percent, 80 85 percent. Um, throughput uh, capacity, um, we're pretty much maxed out. So we've got the nominal capacity of, uh, you know, 650,000 containers a year. But when we hit 85% of that, we're, we're pretty stretched. And one of the things that's happening um, very dramatically right now in the system, uh, in the ecosystem, is that let's just say, you know, Hyundai is uh, uh, a motor uh, manufacturing is up the road in Montgomery, Alabama, two and a half hours away. And um, they have a facility. They are not immune to chip shortages. They're not immune to uh, workers in um, the warehouse, et cetera, et cetera. So where we would typically, our capacity is based on a certain um, velocity with which containers move through the, uh, the through the terminal. And what we're doing right now is fairly adaptive, um, but not normal. Uh, we're taking other lands, uh, we're rocking them really quickly and we're stacking containers so we can meter containers to uh, Hyundai, get them off of our terminal so we can keep the capacity moving forward in the, in the, in the container terminal. Those are things that I think port 
systems throughout the country are looking at right now. I mean, we've, we've heard about the pop-up ports and those types of things, but you've got to get these boxes off of the container terminal um, in order to keep your capacity. But once you get them off the container terminal, then what do you do with them, right? And every box is on a chassis, ties up the chassis that, you know, it, it really is quite of a, a, a bit of a snowball, um, a snowball effect. But we look at about 80 to 85% uh, to be deemed um, the point at which we need um, uh, further investment, uh, either horizontal or vertical. So Beth, I wanted to ask you a question regarding mm -hmm. automation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've worked in Europe, <laughs> first. you've been to Asia many, many, many times. Uh, yeah. Automation, automation around the world. We don't have enough of it in the United States. How do you see the auto, the automation of the, the U S ports industry in the short, medium term? And, and <laughs> why if it does and why not if it doesn't? Yeah, that was a really mean question. Sorry. <laughs> There's not too many labor folks on the on the phone. Um, it is a really big challenge here, right? Um, uh, we do have labor contracts. Uh, there are two different ones that are governing um, uh, ports. Uh, on the West Coast, it's called the ILWU. Um, that is coming up for uh, renewal next year. Um, and if anyone was around in 2014, you... Um, know that that didn't go very well. Um, so, and then on the East Coast and in the Gulf, we have um, what's called the ILA uh, labor negotiation. Um, the automation is one of the toughest. Uh, it, it's one of the toughest, toughest topics um, with the with the longshoremen. Um, and I, I can just uh, right there um, uh, say that. Um, the, LA has been rather successful um, in automating a couple of terminals out there, bringing them on um, in uh, and automating them. It's, it's quite a fascinating um, operation for anyone who hasn't had the, um, the honor of seeing that, uh, that work like that. Um, but I, you know, Frank, I wish I, I had an answer to that. Um, you know, we've, we've got an exceptional labor force down here in the Gulf. Um, they are very open. Um, it was a new terminal that came online where there was nothing before. They're very jobs focused. But automation, you know, scares the labor unions. And so we have to work very collaboratively with them um, to, to work through those uh, to work through those issues. Well, there, there is hope the Europeans were able to deal with it. We yeah. can't do it. So, <laughs> I, heard, I heard a story. I don't know if it's true that when a labor negotiation was coming up, they took a, the labor union leadership to Rotterdam and plopped them down and said, this is coming. Um, but uh, anyway, you know, I don't know if that uh, really had an uh, impact or not, but um, it's, they're, they're tough. They're very, very tough negotiations. So I'm going to ask Martin a question. Nate, I haven't forgotten you. I'm going to be right to you in a minute. So Martin, in this current crisis that we're in, to put it in some perspective to people that are not in the industry, what were the shipping container rates from, say, Asia, China to the West Coast last year, and where are they today? Well, typically they were about fifteen hundred dollars a box into the West Coast for a long time. These days, actually, I've lost track of exactly where they are at the moment, but they'd risen about five or six times um, into um, uh, over the over the last twelve months. So they have risen significantly. And they've risen as much as 10 times uh, to their peak in terms of the spot rates into, the, into Europe from, from Asia. I mean, um, I, I, heard, I heard today, that, and I, I don't know if I can believe this or not, you can confirm this for me, but I heard today that $27,000 a container, is that even possible? Well, it could be because it depends on what surcharges are being applied. And of course, if, that's, uh, using, if that includes the intermodal leg, Right. On the land side as well, that it, it could be, but I mean, and, and also it depends really on how urgently the cargo needs to move. So, and you, many of these headline rates are, are spot rates, um, and therefore cargo moving uh, fairly urgently. Obviously, you've got a large chunk of the cargo, and in fact, the vast majority of cargo moving from Asia into North America is moving under under contract, and they're moving at at, at low, much lower rates. Um, although um, uh, cargo owners are seeing big increases. In their contracted rates, um, uh, as we as we go through the sort of renewal season now and into next year, and so um, sure, rates have risen significantly. Um, 
So we're going to we're going to see spot rates fall off a bit, and we will. Um, but we but we think contract rates will probably continue rising a bit further uh, through the course of this year. Okay. So Nate, could you explain very briefly what precision scheduled railroading is, and whether it is one of the problems today in this crisis that we're seeing? That's almost as easy of a question to answer as Beth's about automating port terminals. Um, so I appreciate your I'm, your I'm um, known for softballs, Nate. Sorry. Your neutrality to provide us some tough things to chew on. So PSR was is really scheduling all aspects of your rail enterprise to maximize utilization of power. That's the locomotives, your crews, your line of road, and your terminals. So it really requires um, scheduling, uh, doing work events further upstream, so not doing big events in huge hump yards you all might have seen, the switching upstream. Talks about running very long trains um, and having densification of each lane or each train. So some of the trends that have happened is smaller intermodal lanes that had less volume that I spoke about earlier have actually been eliminated and focus on just the key lanes that can really maximize it. So in my personal opinion, there are some, anybody running an enterprise, particularly in transportation logistics, has to look for opportunities to maximize your efficiency so you can generate the earnings to invest and grow. I emphatically buy into that. So that's the positive sign. The unpositive sign is it tends to be inflexible and then like I said, precision scheduled railroading requires a precision scheduled world. And that's not what Martin mentioned. That's not what's happening now. And that's been sort of part of the challenge. Uh, huge amounts of labor were, let, were, were furloughed during COVID. Um, had to. I mean, that was tough. But now getting those men and women to come back to work, they're not coming back like we had before. So we've got crew challenges everywhere. It's very hard to reset the network. And I think that's where... PSR has been been challenged. And then lastly, I'm a growth guy. It's all I think about. Um, PSR looks at the operating ratio, a fraction of cost versus revenue. My heart and soul and way I've run on my businesses looks at the growth of retained earnings of growing business, growing margin, not the fraction of the margin. I think PSR gives that less focus in my estimation. Yeah. And <clears throat> do, you, do you think that there's going to be, well, consolidation, further consolidation in the rail industry? And will there be more vertical integration by the railroads, for example, thinking beyond hook and haul, inland, yeah. inland ports, things of that nature? In terms of the mergers, we've got the CPKCS on the dock of the STB or the Surface Transportation Board right now. So the Canadian Pacific acquiring and merging with the Kansas City Southern, including their route into Mexico. So that would be an integrated end-to-end -end railway serving Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. So that's going to go through a process. STB is probably going to need well into 2022 to judge the merits for the, um, is it the public interest, EIS, all that good stuff. Outside of that one, in my personal estimation, I don't see major mergers beyond it. I don't see a transcontinental merger. Everybody talked about you can eliminate Chicago, all sorts of great stuff. But the fact is, is the amount of freight that actually moves coast to coast is quite limited. In fact, length of haul of transportation is down a lot versus what it used to be. So the Benny isn't there. Um, and, and any kind of duplicate or overlapping merger would require so much regulatory review and concessions. I just don't see it really making the, making the number. In terms of vertical integration, you're going to see some of that. Perhaps some of the railways would want to collaborate with real estate professionals, developers to develop more of these hubs. Um, you're going to see some of that. I don't see railways getting into beyond the terminal in terms of trucking. They've got great trucking partners, J.B. Hunt, Schneider Swift, as well as the international lines as well. So maybe some development of matching uh, uh, capital and resources right around the, you know, they focus on building the intermodal hub, the partners build the warehousing and the distribution cluster around it. 
And, and uh, retailers have been doing workarounds from the rail to trucking, other, other modes. Do you think that this current crisis congestion will break the usual partnership between retailers and rail? I think that the rail, I think the rail leadership, the men and women in this industry are gonna have to demonstrate everything they've got to get back on track. And they will, I know they will, but it's tough right now. Um, I mentioned the, the labor shortages, the crews, the congestion that Beth mentioned of, of having to ration even train volume between LA and Chicago. But Benny's are gonna have to see and they're doing it, but we're going to have to do everything humanly possible and beyond to get back in sync. And it can be small things to start, but we're going to need to start chipping away at the mountain, in my estimation, Frank. So, Martin, I'd like you to talk a little bit about BC, not the common era, <laughs> before the common era, but blockchain. And where, where is the industry with blockchain? and actually having a blockchain that will be uh, effective and comprehensive in nature? Well, I think it's a long way off being anywhere near what you're describing there, being comprehensive in nature. There are a number of pilots being undertaken, and there are a number of initiatives being taken place uh, between various stakeholders to try and develop standards um, but it's, it's, it is not that prevalent uh, at the, uh, in terms of the mainstream of how shipping is being conducted at, at the moment. I mean, frankly, shipping still remains relatively quill and pen by comparison with many other, with many other sectors. But um, there is still, there is though a lot of attention and focus being made around um, IT uh, systems and digitization um, and connecting up the, the players in a, in a way that en enables more seamless uh, transactions of trade. Blockchain will be a, a key key part of that, but it's, I think these initiatives have a long way to go uh, before they come mainstream. And, and there's, a, there's been a lot of talk before uh, the widening of the Panama Canal, uh, the shift from the West Coast to East Coast was slowly starting to happen. Uh, then the Panama Canal announces the widening, the widening comes. There were all kinds of mass speculation about how the shift was gonna be up to 20, 25%. Um, and we're here in 2021, 2022. What, what are your views on how much of a shift, if, if any, especially in light of what's going on in San Pedro today, is going to happen to the East Coast U.S.? Well, I think that a lot of the shift has already happened. Yeah. So I think, so before that widening, um, the, the share was um, around 25%. And now that the share over to the East Coast has gone up to around a third of the, of the Trans-Pacific traffic. So there has already been quite a shift. Now, I think the question then is, therefore, how much further of a shift do you expect there to be? Now, there is an initiative at the moment to try and um, enable um, carriers uh, which who have a choice of uh, queuing at a congested Los Angeles or, or uh, going over to, uh, to the East Coast um, uh, at the moment. But I think, frankly, these, these types of ideas will have limited impacts, really. Um, because essentially the cargo coming into on the water coming into the um, into the west coast is destined primarily uh, for uh, that uh, that area and therefore it not doesn't make practical sense to to ship it through uh, through the Panama Canal and through through to the east coast I think what is interesting coming back to what I was presenting earlier or I, I assume it's interesting is the extent is the degree to which the we can develop more port options through mm bolstering the capability of these challenger ports. Now, on the West Coast, there's much less choice there. Uh, but on the East Coast, there is potentially more choice. And I think what's interesting is if you compare 
the the way these the ports operate and carrier services operates in, in North America, if you compare to say Europe, so Europe has faced lots of congestion problems, but they have not manifested to the same degree as you've had in North America, because it is much easier for carriers to move cargo into alternative ports because there is an established feeder network of smaller ships that will take cargo from right. a mainline port and mm-hmm. move that to its ultimate destination. Right. So in fact, there's been huge outcries in, in the UK, for example, because Felix Stowe got so congested um, and therefore carriers were diverting the calls to uh, main, uh, mainland European ports and were providing feedering services into, into Felixstowe. Now, that meant a slightly longer transit time, but what it did do, it enabled the cargo to keep flowing. And I think that's, that's the big challenge in North America is how could you facilitate that or how could you we move to a situation where there's more options for that? And I would have thought there's more options for that possibly on the East Coast, um, but there is not the same network of, uh, of um, short sea uh, shipping services in North America by, by virtue of its, jog- its geography and uh, coastline. And, and that leads me to a question for Nate and Beth or raise a, a, a subject, which is uh, over water transport is the cheapest. The next cheapest is rail. So if you've got that, the West Coast has always had this advantage of the fastest way to Chicago, right? Now, mm-hmm. if you take the over water route through the canal, it opens up Mobile, which is a very interesting port from its diversity, New Orleans, Houston, and opens yep. then up uh, Charleston, Savannah, Jacksonville, Miami, Everglades. Can the, well, can the railroads become so much more efficient that it would still keep the advantage to the West Coast? both from delivery and pricing standpoint? Or will the Gulf and the East Coast take on more than than 25% share to 30% or even 40%? Beth, you want to take a shot? You've got some background on the... Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, So I think the one thing that I would say is that if you look at, um, and I'm I'm looking at a percentage growth because clearly uh, Mobile is is pretty small in terms of its container throughput, but if you look at percentage growth since 2015 of um, terminals, um, ports in the United States, three of the top five fastest growing ports, container ports, are in the Gulf. They are Mobile at 86%, Houston New Orleans, right around uh, 40%, Savannah, and then Jacksonville. And I think that really speaks volumes. We may not be moving millions of containers like uh, the West Coast is, but we're certainly um, got the growth trajectory. And again, getting back to land, um, LA's got nowhere to go but Arizona. Um, You know, Savannah right now, that ring road, if you will, of where distributions are, uh, is now 30 miles out from the port. So, um, you know, I look at, at Mobile and I look at the opportunities here. We are working very, very closely right now with two uh, class one railroads. And within the year, I am fairly confident that we will have some inland ports um, uh, in play here. Um, we have to. Um, yeah. And I think that everyone is, is, you know, if you look at what's going on over in New Orleans with some of the ports there, Um, or uh, to be ports there. Uh, If you look at where the core is doing the widening of uh, of Houston, I just think the Gulf is going to be another very interesting option. Um, And Martin, to your word, optionality is key right now. Uh, Customers have got to have the ability to be able to move their cargo, if not um, over the West Coast and through the Gulf or through the East Coast. And um, we've seen a lot of diversions uh, from the West Coast uh, in, and Savannah, for that matter, into Mobile, because our transit times are, are certainly if you look at um, actual uh, what's happening actually in, on the coast right now, our transit times uh, kind of beat everyone out of the water, but we're, we're competitive. And so companies are really looking at optionality, and we've got to be ready to, to invest some money and the time to be able to set up those inland ports and be able to, you know, uh, develop our um, warehousing and, and distribution uh, footprint. 
I concur 100% with what Beth had to say. Um, if you think about it, Frank, if you're coming off the eastern seaboard and even up the Gulf and you're trying to get to interior points via IPI or rail, think of this. The further you go, the lower the rate you're competing with because of that coming from west. So there is a line of demarcation there. Typically, Ohio Valley um, might, might well be that point. The other one I want to kind of pivot it back to Martin isn't some of the isn't uh, this is a layperson you can t- going to tell right away I'm a rail guy okay but mm-hmm. isn't some of the inflexibility related to the alliances and the large VSAs that require consensus of the players to do diversions to do different ports of call other options what do you think about that well it, well, it might do but often the uh, the and Beth can perhaps talk to this but a lot of the, there are contractual arrangements in place that uh, need to be. Um, need to be honoured and supported. And uh, yes, if with more and more um, alliances and more um, collaboration between different carriers, then it can operationally become an issue if you've got um, uh, vessels uh, diverting uh, cargo to, to different ports. So there, are, so there are some restrictions there. Um, well, I mean, but I think, but if you look at the model in... Um, in Europe, though, you, it, it is quite common to see vessels being diverted in that in that way, and but there needs to be a way in which the cargo can be rerouted back to its um, destination point, so that uh, uh, so that it can fulfil uh, the operational requirements. Go on, Beth. Sorry. No, I was just going to add on to what you said, which is another um, uh, another input to all those decision factors around the alliances. And we see this, uh, you know, in Mobile and everywhere else is uh, that the parent companies of ocean alliances are um, of these ocean carriers are also in the terminal business. So, uh, you know, if you yeah. have uh, an, an M2, a 2M alliance of Maersk and, and MSC, and APMT is operating the container terminal here in Mobile, but it's MSC that's operating the one in uh, New Orleans or Houston. Well, guess what? Um, you know, uh, there, you know. So those negotiations go on as, as well. But um, it's really the the beneficial cargo owner that's going to drive um, a lot of where the network is set up and how it's set up, especially that discretionary uh, network. We always are are telling folks, look, if you've got fifty thousand containers, just go knock on the door; they'll open it. Um, and if the service doesn't exist today, the service certainly can exist in the future. So. Um, I think that's also, you know, it's really up to the, a lot of times the beneficial cargo owners too, to make their impact. And, you know, certainly Walmart and uh, the likes of Walmart have, have, have driven a lot of the network. Nate, uh, question from one of the attendees. STB sent letters to railroads warning about regulating rail intermodal. Do you think the government regulators could do this with the bad performance of rail intermodal in a critical peak season? I, again, my personal opinion, um, one of the benefits of the STB is they've got the bully pulpit. And that may have as much of an advantage of, of having the dialogue that's necessary for everybody to work on improving performance than regulating intermodal. It was a, it's a non-regulated, it was done some time ago out of staggers, here I go with history again, but out of staggers to allow the, the intermodal to grow at market rates and it's been incredibly successful. Um, and part of the challenges of the intermodal performance, as Beth mentioned, is because warehouses are packed full, you can't get an appointment that Terminals are dwell, excuse me, containers are dwelling in rail terminals by one BCO that doesn't give the room for the BCO with the hot move to deramp and get out of there. So it needs to be a collaborative approach. BCO, beneficial cargo owner. Yes. We're yes. talking to real estate people here. Yep. Sorry. So uh, let's shift into globalization with what's happened in the last five, six, seven years, reshoring all of these things, is globalization going to continue or is it gonna be restricted a little bit in its growth? And will there be more localized manufacturing, distribution, things of that nature? Martin, and then I'll go to Beth and Nate. 
Um, well, I, I think that certainly one of the things that's come out of the pandemic, but frankly, it was a trend that was uh, going on for some time before, uh, is this shift in a way from this focus around optimizing cost uh, to, to optimizing resilience. Um, and so the, the effect of that in terms of sourcing patterns has been for companies to develop more alternative sources. So uh, if they're sourcing from China into the US, for example, um, they'll, they'll, the tendency will be to continue to source from China, but also to have alternative sources from other, um, other origins. Vietnam, Which typically, Indonesia. exactly. So that so it's it is the South uh, East Asian countries that are seeing the benefit of that, and you're already seeing that today. So if you look at the trade patterns already up until even before the pandemic, um, you could see that, that the shift and the change uh, already taking place. And indeed, you've got many of these uh, Chinese uh, manufacturers have been investing in Southeast Asia for that for that very reason. Um, so I think we'd like to see more of that. Um, and yes, sure, there could be some more um, manufacturing taking place nearer to home or at home. Um, but I think global trade will continue to grow. Globalization will continue to be here. Um, mm. And um, but I think that the pattern of that trade and the way sourcing works will inevitably evolve uh, into slightly different ways. Um, so but I, I think that um, anyone who's writing off globalization, I think, is um, uh, risks are being proved wrong. Beth? I was going to just build on that and say, you know, uh, when you when you talk about when one talks about nearshoring, and I think we will see um, certainly for just in time um, uh, raw materials and other product feeds potentially locating a little closer to the source that's needing them. But when you think about that too, um, you know, here's how the, the five whys go. Well, so um, you're going to bring that company a little closer to your manufacturing office. So where is that company getting, where is that company sourcing from? Where's that, where they're, right. they're sourcing, sourcing, but you know, you kind of go down the, the stream and eventually it, 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 it's, it's not local or it's not near, uh, nearby. And so somewhere along that stream, um, you you are still dealing with the same uh, challenges. So it, it has to be very thoughtfully um, put together. And I, I think, Martin, you're absolutely right. And we're so uh, globally interconnected now that I'm not sure that um, uh, anything is really going to rip that apart. It's just going to be a matter of how people think about it and, and how the, the tweaks that we make to um, build that resiliency and optionality. And I think that's the key is the optionality. Yet, an excellent example of what the, the nearshoring localization is right up the road from you yeah. with Mercedes-Benz. Yeah, absolutely. So, Mr. Railroad. Um, I worked in Mexico for a number of years. Um, a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues, a lot of customers and really believe in it. Um, I think USMCA helped pay for more certainty because that, with that being the old NAFTA agreement being in flux really caused, you know, people don't, they can deal with risk, but they don't like uncertainty. So that is done. Um, that between our three countries is firm. And that I think is paves a path. The other thing is, um, how do I put this tactfully and with the greatest amount of respect? Um, you need to have contract and concession certainty in Mexico. Um, some folks, want to go back to 1970. Uh oh, I'm getting in trouble, but you've got to have that. <laughs> and the result of the Mexico elections back in July, the lower house, um, the president lost that. You've now got more of a, of, of a plurality. Um, so with the best of intentions, some rat massive um, extreme conditions of negating concessions in contract law have, has largely been dissipated now. So I think you'll see, for Beth and, and Marty's, Martin's perspectives, some niche sourcing opportunities that might have been on the drawing board for Mexico and even other parts of Central and Latin America can, can come, come to fruition now. So I will end with this excellent question from Anonymous, one of the attendees. <laughs> Short answers, please. Looking into your crystal balls, parentheses, don't say you don't have any. When do things go back to some semblance of normality? Well, 
Well, uh, well, we've already made very clear, Drury, that um, we think that the current disruption will continue through the course of next year, and probably in some part into 2023. Beth? Uh, oh, sorry. I I think though that the other I think the other thing to question though is what will normality be? Right. And I think that you cannot expect everything to return to how it was pre-pandemic. And I think in particular, uh, the shipping industry is now much more concentrated. The carriers have uh, more market control. And I think the days of cheap shipping are probably over. So I think that whilst we're going to see uh, shipping costs fall, Mm -hmm. you won't see them fall down to anything near the levels that they were at pre-pandemic. I think that has pretty important implications. So, Um, Thank you, Martin. And we're coming up against a, a hard stop here, Beth and Nate. So I I don't disagree with you, Martin. I think that we're looking at um, certainly uh, through at least part of next year. Um, I think we're all hopeful, sort of like we are with the pandemic, that one of these days this thing's going to be over. Um, But I will say that um, at least for the United States, a real wild card uh, going into next year is the West Coast labor negotiations. That is um, uh, that is, is, is quite a prospect that could, uh, at least from the U.S. perspective, really um, um, have some s- severe uh, impact. So um, I'm with you. I think it's going to be sometime next year and cross fingers, um, all of them, um, that the labor negotiations go well. Hey, Frank, I, th- I agree with, with Martin and Beth's perspective. I think there's one thing that that causes all of us as individuals, as, as companies, as, as, as communities, as collaborators in this business is when, when you see Mount Everest in front of you, it's daunting. <laughs> it, it, it's discouraging. It, oh, how are we going to do this? My only sage advice, and I need to do it myself in my daily life. Don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. Start <laughs> chipping away at the mountain now, and we will get back to Martin's version of normality sooner. These things that Beth mentioned and, and Martin and Frank and, and team, we've got collectively, we've got to get after it. Don't yeah. allow other people to be part of the solution. So I will leave all of us with my, uh, my thoughts on the main takeaway of this. It, uh, this industry, our industry for decades was in a, a pretty predictable state of evolution. I think in the last decade, maybe a little longer, it quickly entered a state of revolution. I think that state of revolution is only going to accelerate. And with that, I turn it over to our chairman, Michelle. (laughs) Thank you, Frank. Wise words. Wow, what an amazing session. Um, I guess we could continue all afternoon, yet uh, I don't think Martin would appreciate that. He's pretty lazy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I appreciate you staying on, Martin. Um, so thank you so much, Frank, Beth, Nate, Martin. Sure. As uh, sure. backlogs persist uh, at ports in the U.S. and around the world, supply chain logistics are at the epicenter of what makes the economy function. And commercial real estate is the field on which it all plays out. Again, thank you all. And on-demand recording are available for most What's Next sessions, and all registrants today will receive today's recordings. Uh, Look for details soon on the terrific lineup for 2022 on What's Next for Real Estate events. Until then, on behalf of the Councillors of Real Estate, thank you for attending. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Frank. This session was amazing. (laughs) Stay tuned for the next sessions. So long. Okay, bye.